Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. I just want to say welcome to everyone who's in-house today. Man, we made it here somehow. Um, we did it. And those of you joining us uh, online today, I know there's a lot of us uh, joining online today. Thank you for being a part of our gathering today. It's, it's an awesome opportunity uh, today uh, to, to really start our week in worship uh, towards our Savior. And maybe you haven't noticed this, but we're experiencing some of the coldest temperatures we've ever seen here in Edmonton right now. Um, it's, it's very cold outside. Um, in fact, like the airport, Edmonton Airport yesterday, I uh, saw a degrees Celsius. Um, that's cold. Um, very, very cold. Uh, my, car, my car told me how cold it was this morning um, when I was trying to start it, and, and it took a while. It started. Now, I, I just recently bought a 2004 Corolla, and I trust it more than many of the other cars I've ever owned in my life. And so, man, I'm excited. I'm grateful for a car that started. I started it real early this morning. I got up real early. I was like, I got to make it to church. We got our cars ready. Parked one car in the garage, our van. And I was like, I'm ready to boost my car in the morning if I have to. We parked them like nose to nose, right? And I was like, please start, right? And it started first try, which I was like, man, this car is the best investment of my life, you know? Um, but before I, I start our message today, I want to uh, let you know we have a prayer and fast uh, coming up uh, at the end of January here. It's a three-day prayer and fast. Uh, yeah, and uh, last year, we've done this every year uh, since uh, Beth and I got here. And it's some powerful times together to pray uh, corporately for, for our church. Um, and it's going to be uh, Monday night, uh, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night. We're really going to be getting together uh, as, a, as a family and praying together. And each night of that prayer and fast, we're going to have something specific happening. And each night, we're going to have some worship. Um, and if you were with us last year, it's a powerful time together. Um, and we're going to break the fast uh, Wednesday night with communion. And then last year, my second break fast was Subway right after. Um, I was like, what's the healthiest, non-healthy kind of fast food I can get? Like, it's like Subway convinced us that eating a loaf of bread is healthy, right? And I don't get it. Um, but I love Subway. It's like one of my favorite spots. That's where I went after. But I want to encourage you to come on out. Um, so we're going to be starting our fast at midnight uh, on the uh, 28th, it would be. Um, and so, and it may, so for us, like you can fast something, it might be food, um, it might be soda, it might be coffee, uh, it might be social media, it might be Netflix, it might be your phone, I don't know what it is for you, but I want to encourage you, um, even as a family, figure out something that you can do together. Um, to be honest, it's not really about, you know, not eating for three days, because that's, that's not what this is about. Really what this is about, our parent fast, is for us to spend three days growing closer to Jesus. Um, together and kind of hearing what God has for us as a family, but also what God has for us as individuals. Um, we're going to have uh, one of the nights, Tuesday night, we'll have like an open mic where you can come share some of the things God has on your heart, whether it's scriptures or whatever. Uh, we'll be doing that. And then uh, Wednesday night, we're going to have a, 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 a gathering and some prayer. And uh, I'm going to speak a message and then we're going to break our fast with communion. So I want to encourage you to come be a part of it. Uh, it's not easy, I'll be honest, three days of, of fasting something, but I want to encourage you uh, to come and be a part of it those three days. It's going to be a powerful time. I truly believe it. Um, but we're continuing in our series today. We started last week. And if you were with us last week, you know um, we, we started a series called Required. And we're, gonna, we're going through um, Micah chapter 6, verse 8, um, which is uh, the verse that kind of God gave me um, that I believe God has given me for our church uh, for 2024. And it's kind of a unique verse. Um, at first, I was like, God, what are you trying to say? And he's like, you'll see. And I was like, all right, man. Like, um, but this is Micah chapter 6, verse 8. It says this. He says, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. It's such an amazing verse. And I've been spending a lot of time diving into it. And there's so much in this verse. And last week, um, we kind of, I kind of started just with an introduction um, to the book of Micah, kind of the context of what this was written in um, and why this was written and what this kind of verse was supposed to speak to the nation. Um, and, and you'll, 
and really, if you missed it, I want to encourage you to go check it out. It's on our, our YouTube page. You can get caught up. But really, we looked at how corrupt and unjust Israel was becoming, how greedy and corrupt they were becoming, how far they had moved away from God and kind of where they were headed as a nation. And it's kind of talking about what was about to come. An oppressive nation was going to come and take over their land. And, and this verse kind of comes in the middle, kind of near the end of this book. And it's Micah, he hears God speaking and he's, he, he shares what he feels God is speaking um, to his people. And, and it's really to answer this question, what is good? What is required? What is good? And how do we push against this culture that's been, that's been happening? How do we push against the cruelty? And how do we push against the greed? How do we push against the things that are coming in and kind of attacking our nation from the inside out? How do we push against greed and disobedience? And really breaks it down simply to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. These three uh, characteristics or these three postures that, 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 that God was speaking to a nation on. If they wanted to change the way things were going, this is how they did it. And it wasn't just something that God spoke. He said, he's already shown you, right? If you go back to the verse, it says, uh, he has shown you, O mortal, or he's shown you, O human, or he's shown you, Dustin, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you? He's shown you. So it's not like God is asking us to do something he's not already done. He's not, it's not like God is asking us to do something that he's not already shown us. He's saying, I already showed you. So start living it out to act justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That's what this verse, his context is. So the question, we're going to go through act justly, love mercy, walk humbly over the next three weeks. I think the, one of the biggest questions we have to ask is what is justice? I think it's a big question on what is justice? And how do we live a life filled with justice? And Pastor Tim Keller, uh, who's an incredible man who's, who's recently passed away, but he said this in an article that he wrote called Justice in the Bible. He says, biblical justice is not uh, a set of bullet points or a set of rules and guidelines. It is rooted in the very character of God, and it is the outworking of that character, which is never less than just. Basically saying that biblical justice is part of God's character. That's, that's who he is. And he goes on to say this. He says, biblical justice is characterized by radical generosity, universal equality, life-changing advocacy, and asymmetrical responsibility. He says that this is what biblical justice is characterized by, is generosity, equality, advocacy, and responsibility. So what Pastor Tim Keller shares in this article that he wrote, and I was reading it uh, this week. And what I think he's saying when he's writing this, and it's obviously, there's so much in it. But I think he's saying that if we want to be people of justice, biblical justice, we fight greed with generosity. Remember Micah, he, they were saying, hey, the, the, the nation was greedy. Pro prophets were being bribed to say certain things. And it was a greedy nation. And how do you fight against greed in culture or fight against greed in our own hearts? We be generous. The antidote to greed is generosity. How do we become less greedy? Give more and take less. Give more to the people around us. How do we fight bias? We fight it with equality. How do we fight opposition? We fight it with advocacy. How do we fight indifference? We fight it with responsibility. I think what, 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 what this verse is saying is like, this is how you fight against the things that are trying to take your heart or take your family. We fight it by being generous, by being people who see other people with equality, and we are advocates for one another, and we fight indifference with responsibility. If, that if we want to act justly, it means we have to be generous even if the people we're being generous to don't deserve it. That's hard. It's hard to be generous when you see someone living a lifestyle and a life where you're like, yo, that's not the best. We have to be generous with people even if we don't even agree with them all the way. To be generous with people who need it, even if they don't deserve it. Even if every part of our spirit, every part of us is saying no. Oftentimes God is saying yes. And that's what Beth and I tried to do in our lives this Christmas season is to be more generous than we've ever been in our lives. 
And I say this not in a place of pride, of like a place of, it's not easy all the time. It's not easy all the time to be generous. But it's so important if we want to be people of justice. See, generosity, again, is the antidote to greed. We have to act justly and give freely. I think also if we want to be people of justice, that means we have to look at humanity and see them as the same and view people as equal. That no matter their race or beliefs or ideology or political standing or relationship status or gender, what do we do? We see them the same way that Jesus sees them. We see them with love and we give them what we have. I think for so long there's been this, the, the, this, this, this conversation and you see this so much about equality right now. There's all these conversations and some things good, some things are tough. But I think if we want to be people of justice, it's being people who love people even if, again, they don't deserve it. Because that's exactly my life. The love I've received from Jesus, the love that God has poured out to me, I don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. But God looks at me and he sees me and he loves me. That we look at people, we see them with love in our eyes and in our heart with the intention of showing them the deep, powerful, life-changing, profound love of Jesus. I think so many times, at least in my life, I've seen people, and sometimes it's the people who need it the most are the people that I'm the least willing to go share Jesus with. The people who need it the most, you know what's easy to share with Jesus with? Is to be honest, on this stage, sharing to people who already know about Jesus. This is the easiest place. Like this isn't like, some people it's like talking publicly scary for me, I've done it so many times. This isn't scary for me. But do you know what would be scary is just on the street one day or at lunch one day, sitting down at McDonald's, having a conversation with someone about Jesus. Sometimes that's a lot more scary. Sometimes the audience of one is more scary than the audience of a thousand because they're the years who actually have to hear it. We have to stop looking at ourselves as better than people. Despite our education or despite our job title, despite what we know. We have to stop looking at other people as less than us because they have a less education or they make less a year or they, they drive a 2004 Corolla. I'm just joking. <laughs> like, I love my car, to be honest. I love it, okay? It's like, it's one of my favorite cars I've ever owned and it's like, everything is manual in it. Windows, doors, but my mirrors uh, are electric. Makes no sense to me but I kind of love it. But we have to learn to love people properly. If we want to see justice reign in our lives, it requires us to be advocates for other people. Especially those whose voice has been put on mute by culture, society, or tradition. This is what Proverbs 31, eight to nine says. This kind of convicted me. It says this, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed crushed. Yes, speak up for the poor and helpless and see that they get justice. You know what advocacy is really? just speaking up when we see injustice happening. Giving when we see a need. Serving when we see a gap. Loving when we see isolation. Connecting when we see people running away. This is what it says in Deuteronomy. True justice must be given to foreigners living among you and to orphans. And you must never accept the widow's garment as security for her debt. Foreigners and widows and orphans. In some situations, these are the people with the lowest stature or the smallest voice. And our justice and our love cannot change based on someone's income bracket or the color of their skin. It can't change. If you want to be people of justice, we also have to take responsibility. Take responsibility for our own actions and also take this responsibility for being a light in the darkness and bringing love to the world. That's our responsibility as followers of Jesus. You know, just because something isn't our fault doesn't mean it's not our responsibility. Just because you didn't cause the issue doesn't mean it's not our responsibility to take care of it. You know, I didn't bring the trauma in your life so you can figure it out on your own. It's not my fault that you're living in addiction. It's not my fault that there's hungry people in the world. It's not my fault that there's people living in this, on the streets. It's not my fault. I didn't cause it. 
So what a lot of us do is we say, I didn't cause it, so someone else will deal with it. Someone else will take care of it. I'm not going to take responsibility for this because it's not going to be easy for me to actually follow through with this situation. It's not going to be easy for me to follow through and love in spite of it all. It's not going to be easy. And I'm so glad that Jesus didn't have that attitude towards me. Because you know what's not Jesus' fault is my sin. It's not his fault. But he took the responsibility of that so that I could be free. So that I could have relationship. So I could be connected to the Father. So I could be forgiven. That's what Jesus did for me. And I need to do the same. I'm so glad he didn't have that attitude towards me. He didn't cause me to sin, but he made it his responsibility to bring justice. To give himself, to give us a way out. That is what justice is. Biblical justice is characterized by radical generosity, universal equality, life-changing advocacy, and asymmetrical responsibility. You know, Jesus gives us a parable in Matthew that I think sheds some light into what justice is and how countercultural and counter-normal it is. Even with business practices, Matthew 20, verse 1 to 16, kind of a long portion here, but it says this. For the kingdom of heaven is like the landowner who went out early one morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay the normal daily wage and sent them out to work. At nine o'clock in the morning, he was passing through the marketplace and saw some people standing around doing nothing. So he hired them, telling them he would pay them whatever was right at the end of the day. So they went to work in the vineyard at noon, and again at three o'clock, he did the same thing. At five o'clock that afternoon, he was in town again, and he saw some more people standing around. He asked them, why haven't you been working today? They replied, because no one hired us. The landowner told them, then go out and join the others in my vineyard. That evening, he told the foreman to call the workers in and pay them, bringing with the last workers first. When those hired at five o'clock were paid, each received a full day's wage. When those hired first came to get their pay, they assumed they would receive more, but they too were paid a day's wage. Injustice. When they received their pay, they protested to the owner. Those people worked only one hour, and yet you paid them just as much as you paid us who worked all day in the scorching heat. He answered one of them, friend, I haven't been fair. I haven't been unfair. Didn't you all agree to work all day for the usual wage? Take your money and go. I wanted to pay the last worker the same as you. Is it against the law for me to do what I want to do with my money? Should you be jealous because I was kind to others? So those who are last now will be first then, and those who are first will be last. That's what justice is in the kingdom. And obviously we look at this verse and we see it in the context of life and how some of us, we, we find Jesus earlier in our life and some of us find Jesus later. Some of us, we find Jesus in our deathbed. And part of the conversation is about how justice is about, it doesn't matter. What matters is that we find Jesus. Because he says, I'll pay you just, just, he says, I'll pay you a just wage. He didn't lie to them. He told them, I'm going to pay you what is right for the day. And he told that to everyone working. And he did exactly that. He paid a just wage to everyone. They had agreed to this and he had paid them. We want justice to go one way. Do you know what we want? We want to get what we deserve and we want them to get what they deserve. We want to get what I deserve. I worked hard. I, I, I did a lot of work. I, I'm awesome. I did great. They worked less hard. So I want to get what I deserve and I want them to get what they deserve, which is less than what I deserve. I think this is an attitude that's destroying relationships. As we become so competitive with each other, competitive over our talent or competitive over how much we pray or read the Bible or how many people we get saved, how many people found healing or, or whatever through us. And when someone has done less, we're like, I can't associate with you. Look how many followers I have on Instagram. I've, see, I've, like, I've seen this attitude so much and it's destroying so many things. 
We want justice to go our way, not their way. You know, even Jonah, he had this exact attitude, right? When he, when he goes to Nineveh and they all get saved, he's like, God, like, I'm be- very much paraphrasing. He's like, yeah, that sucked. That was horrible. They're horrible people. But I think this attitude creeps into us today is we want people to get what they deserve and we want to get what we deserve and what we want to deserve is a lot more than we, what we think they deserve. I worked harder, I deserve more. You know, I imagine, I was thinking about this this morning and I was thinking about this. I imagine that's how my classmates felt when I was put into a group project with them in high school. Like, I, I imagine like people who are like, you know, A plus students and all of a sudden you get this guy who's like, hopefully he showed up today, you know? He's like, he's not gonna do anything. He's gonna get a good grade. Uh, I, I had this memory this morning of one day we were asked, I was, we were learning about um, the czar and we we're learning about Russia. I forget what grade we were in, in elementary. And we were tasked to create like a scene from the, the story. And so me and my friend, we created like the palace and his dad had a wood shop. We built this cool palace and it was awesome. But then as a joke, we made this like horrible looking room and we smeared like paint on it, red paint. And we said it was the room that the czar's family died in. And we presented that to our whole class. And our teacher was like shocked. And then we like pulled out the actual masterpiece. Anyway, I just thought about that story and I thought it was so funny still. I don't think the teacher thought it was as funny though. You know, when people are generous, but we're not on the side of that generosity, we feel like it's an injustice. When someone gets what we think we want, they get the promotion, we don't get it. You ever been working somewhere and they hire somebody making more than you for the same job and you're supposed to train them? You ever had that? That sucks. It's like, give me a raise now or I'm leaving, right? This is our culture. It's all about us. It's all about what I can get and what's best for me and what's best for, for, for me. And it's all about me. We've got to change this attitude in our lives. And then later, Matthew links justice and generosity toward the most in need again in the confrontation between Jesus and the, uh, the chief priests. It says this in Matthew 21. But what do you think about this? A man with two sons told the older boy, son, go out and work in the vineyard today. The son answered, no, I won't go. But later changed his mind and went anyway. Then the father told the other son, you go. And he said, yes, sir, I will. But he didn't go. And he asked which one obeyed the father. Your parents, his parents were like, neither, right? They both are liars. <laughs> they replied the first. And it's funny when, when you read through these conversations Jesus has specifically with the priests and like Pharisees, they don't have a lot of words to say when he asks them these questions. Oftentimes it's like, I don't know. This one says the first, right? Then Jesus explained his meaning. And this is, this is brutal, to be honest. I tell you the truth, corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you do. Wow. For John the Baptist came and showed you the right way. You saw it. He taught you, but you didn't believe him. While tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even when you saw this happening, you refused to believe him and repent of your sins. It'd be like God walking into like, a, like our church and like saying this to us. Jesus, like prostitutes and tax collectors are going into heaven before you. That's brutal. <laughs> but it shows how important this is that we know the way we're supposed to live and how justice has come to us. And you see the way of justice here in this context refers to restorative, not retributive justice. A kind of justice that is inclusive and affects healing, not a kind of justice that is exclusive and affects alienation between those who have and those who don't. It's this space of restoration for us, that this justice we receive is God fighting for us, to restore us. See, God is in the business of restoration. He wants to restore us and restore you and restore me back to him, to restore our minds and to restore our hearts and to restore us back to him. 
and we might miss it. Why? Because we're so focused on ourselves. We often miss out on those who need him and need his love. I'm gonna invite Chelsea to come here. But God wants to restore us. And we think about justice. God is fighting for you and fighting for me. And this is what James said in regards to religion. And I think this is so powerful. It's one of my favorite verses here. James 1.27 says this, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. It's not about spiritual practices. It's not even the gifts of the Spirit. It's not church attendance. It's not giving. Obviously, all of those things help and they, 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 they build us and they help us grow, of course. But true religion, pure and genuine religion is taking care of the least among us, showing justice to those who might not even deserve it, who haven't even earned it, yet we still give, yet we're still generous, yet we still take responsibility to make a difference, to bring an impact. And if religion leaves us, leads us to hate and not love, I think we have a problem. If our religion teaches us to hate one another and despise one another, I don't think we're doing it right. And I think this is where, and I say this in a space of conviction, is I think this is where some of us as followers of Jesus have gone wrong in some ways. See, how many times has religion caused us to alienate people and not restore people? We become known by what we hate and not by who we love. We're known for what we're against rather than what we're for. It saddens me that so many people have been so hurt by the church because of people. And of course, we're all broken people. I'm gonna tell you, as your pastor, as a pastor for almost 10 years, I've hurt people. And there's some people I know I've hurt and it was unintentional through whatever it was. And I want you to know, as your pastor, I will fail you. We're gonna fail each other. But I think we need to learn how to get back up and still have a relationship even when there's pain and hurt to be honest with each other and continue to love one another. That there's so many people in our world who have been so hurt by religion. And my, my hope and my prayer is that we're gonna see this year restoration. You know, our world needs just love. People, like we need love. That's what true religion is, genuine religion taking care of the weakest among us, the voiceless, and, not, and refusing to let the world corrupt us. That we say, focus, stay focused on Jesus, focus on what he teaches, and we go and take care of people. Taking care of the least among us, showing justice to those who might not even deserve it. That's what we need to be about. You know, in our church, we have a, what we call our culture guide. It's our core values. And these are them. Number one, Jesus is our purpose. That's what we're about. Number two, people are our heartbeat. Serving is our honor. Leadership is our call. Generosity is our nature. Connection is our passion. And excellence is our gift. You know, these are all the things that we want to be about. And to be honest, we don't get it right all the time. But as God was speaking this to me like three years ago or two years ago, I just felt him saying like, it's gotta be about people. Like me first, of course, but by, by me, I don't mean me. Like I mean him, right? Like it's all about me. No, no, I hope not. If it ever is, please tell me, right? Like, but it's gotta be about people. 
They're all about loving Jesus and loving people, serving and leading and giving and connecting and excelling in the areas that God has called us to. So Jesus is why we do this and people are our mission and the rest of that is how we do it. How do we do it? We bring the best we have. How do we do it? We do it by connecting with each other. Going to small groups and showing, going to potlucks and going into each other's homes and eating meals together, inviting each other over on a cold winter day for lunch. How do we make sure people are a heartbeat? How do we do that? How do we make sure that we love people and take care of people? We do it by serving and leading and giving and connecting and excelling. You know, our takeaway today is that quote um, from, from uh, uh, Timothy Keller is that justice is being radically generous, fighting for universal equality, striving to give life-changing advocacy and being asymmetrically responsible. This is how we need to act and this is how we need to respond. This is how we need to take care of each other. Advocates for one another. Stop talking bad about each other behind our backs and start lifting each other up. Loving people and it's important. I want to end with this story. Maybe you've heard this before. It says there was a judge whose son was brought before him for a crime he had committed. The judge felt a deep grief that his son would violate the laws upon which he based his entire life. It says tears welled up in his eyes as he listened painfully as the evidence against his son was presented. The courtroom sat down in silence wondering how the judge would rule. It's a tough situation. Would he just give him a reprimand in an act of mercy? Would he give him the minimum penalty for the offense? But much to their surprise, he handed out the maximum fine, upholding the law to its fullest degree. And his, it says the son was in shock for he knew he couldn't pay the fine and was anguished at the thought of imprisonment. He looked up at him in disbelief, like, dad, like how? But then something happened that nobody expected. He stepped down from the bench, took off his judge's robe and told his son how much he loved him and then paid out of his own pocket the fine he had just handed down. Not everyone understood what he had done. As a judge, he showed his commitment to honor the law to its fullest, but then stepped down from the seat of honor and showed his love for his child. His son never understood the depth of his father's commitment to the law until that moment. And until that moment, he never knew the depth of his father's love for him says he felt the deep sorrow for the pain he had caused him and for those that he had hurt in this act of crime. With his head bowed and tears in his tears flowing, flowing freely, he asked for his forgiveness, which he willingly and freely gave to him. This is the God that we serve. The God of justice. <laughs> right? The God who, who will hand out the law to its fullest potential but then we'll step in and take it from me, for us. The one who offers us a way out, which has nothing to do with us. It's, not a, it's, it's nothing to do with how good we are. Nothing to do by anything other than a gracious God who loves us deeply and gave himself for us. We have to remember that we received his justice. So our responsibility is to share the same justice that we received. It's not always easy, but I want to encourage you. It's powerful. I want to pray for us today. God, I thank you for this moment, this cold winter day in January. God, first of all, we come before you humbled and grateful for what we receive from you. Justice. That even though we didn't deserve it, even though we couldn't earn it, you still gave your life for us. So God, we just are grateful today. And God, I pray that in our gratitude, in a moment of reflection, God, I pray that you teach us to do the same. That at work, 
in our businesses, in our families, in our churches, God, that justice will reign and that we will act justly. To those who might not even deserve it, who can't earn it, the lowest of low, the people without the voice, God, help us lift them to a place where their voice matters again. God, we love you and we're grateful for you. In Jesus' name, amen.